Thanks for joining us here today on Mindset Matters with Dr. Lisa Dunn. Each week, you'll gain practical tools to activate your faith, reset your organizational culture, and transform your interpersonal relationships. If you have questions about today's show, or if you'd like to be a guest on a future show, you can email Dr. Dunn at contact at drlisadunn.com. That's contact at drlisadunn, spelled D-U-N-N-E, dot com. Or text the word mindset to 52855. That's mindset to 52855. To learn more about our sponsor, Chula Vista Christian University, visit cvcu.us. That's cvcu.us. And be sure to join us right here next Saturday at 11 p.m. for the next episode of Mindset Matters. It's such an honor to have Kevin McGarry with us in the studio this week. He spoke at Chula Vista Christian University yesterday and brought such wisdom and industry disruption, as we call it at our church, that I wanted to introduce him to our radio audience. Kevin, it is such a joy to have you with us today, all the way from San Francisco. Well, the honor is all mine. I am really, really privileged to be here with you. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and what motivated you to step up to the front line in this hour? So my background, I was born and raised in uh, inner city San Francisco. I was born in uh, the Hunter's Point uh, projects, uh, project housing up there. So abject poverty, first uh, six, seven years of my life, and then moved to a lower middle class community. Uh, all inner city, uh, did all of your basic uh, inner city type stuff. Uh, so, you know, if you could remember the boys in the hood as a movie, and I was one of those kind of boys in the hood like that. And, um, and, and so I, that was sort of my, you know, growing up life. And uh, I went to San Jose State, got a sociology degree. So really, really kind of steeped in the, the culture, steeped in leftist progressivism, steeped in, you know, understanding about poverty. So the Lord really gave me kind of a good baseline, excuse me, baseline, if you will, of what it's like to... Uh, grow up poor, what it's like to be in sort of urbanized communities, what it's like to, um, how do you best understand what's happening in our urban communities? And as a sociology major, that kind of uh, gave me a lot of perspective that way as well. Thank you so much for sharing that, Kevin. You know, you and I talked earlier about some of the lessons that we've learned from our painful past and how those unifying human experiences of brokenness in our childhood, what they've done in us, what they've built in us. And neither you nor I can be defined as privileged for sure, but yet by God's grace and, and really by his grace alone, we've overcome and we've become testimonies of his transformative power. So why now, Kevin, what motivated you to want to step up and speak up at this moment in history? Yeah. So um, one of the things is, uh, you know, when I started to take my faith seriously, the Lord really dealt with me on a number of issues, uh, discipleship primarily amongst them. Uh, and then the other one would be taking, um, he really lifted the veil and had me begin to take my civic engagement, uh, sort of my political uh, ideology to a whole nother level. After he lifted the veil for me and my wife, we began to see the world differently. Uh, we really looked at sort of how we were raised. Uh, my wife was raised in inner city Detroit. And uh, in our politics and our civic engagement, we began to like question and really uh, interrogate and weigh it against the word of God. Now, I understand that this doesn't happen for everybody this way, but it happened for me and my wife this way. And um, and and we, we, you, we basically began to shift. And so I became much more active uh, and much more actively involved in the community. I'd be, uh, later, I'd be uh, later. I was uh, I took over responsibility and began to serve as the chairman of the Frederick Douglass Foundation of San Francisco, excuse me, of California. And uh, and so I've been the Frederick Douglass Foundation chairman of California for about 10 years. During that time, uh, much more activism. And then after seeing the riots, the chaos, the calamity, the violence and all of that last summer, via Black Lives Matter and all of our black and brown businesses or a lot of our black and brown businesses and urban communities being uh, burned to the ground and, uh, you know, really being uh, violated. And then the individuals as well being violated just because of their skin color. I, um, I said, look, we, we really need to do something different here. There's a lot of churches that are marching 
with uh, Black Lives Matter. They may not understand really why they're marching, but they uh, they obviously agree with the sentiment. It's hard not to agree with the sentiment after you see nine minutes or so of somebody being murdered that way. So we understood the sentiment that black lives indeed do matter. Um, And a lot of people wanted to uh, really support that. But when you looked at the organization, the organization had its own issues, its public statements about they being radical revolutionary Marxists. There are public statements about the nuclear family and about transgenderism and some of the things that just don't, it doesn't quite, they're antithetical to a faith foundation. So anyway, um, we wanted to give people a, uh, an alternative to BLM. We, we wanted people to come alongside, if you're really concerned about black plight, great. Um, but you don't have to be relegated to BLM as the only black organization. Actually, BLM, by their own admission, says they're only concerned with police brutality and white on black uh, police brutality at that. So, I mean, it's a very, very, very narrow uh, focus. And we felt that there was enough momentum with that, uh, enough momentum with people wanting to try to help and agree with the sentiment that they really, we we wanted to come alongside and come up with an organization that was, uh, you know, biblically sound, uh, faith-based organization that would actually do the work, the hard work, all of the black, all of the work related to black plight. And uh, that would be uh, from the womb to the tomb, from conception to the grave. Uh, There are a number of plight issues, uh, not only in the womb, but then there's early childhood development, then there's education, then there's fatherhood, then there's, you know, uh, stray bullets. And then there's, uh, you know, criminal justice reforms. Then there's, you know, poverty programs, food deserts, all kinds of things. And we wanted to be in the middle of that. So we started Every Black Life Matters. It's very similar to BLM uh, from a nomenclature perspective, but we have very, very different ways about going out to actually help and support black life. And uh, so, you know, that's that's really how I got involved in this. That's and kind of the trajectory that we've been on and it's been it's been a fantastic ride we've been helping a lot of uh, families and we've certainly been standing up for the black community and communities of faith as it uh, as it relates to a lot of these sort of complex social issues that we're trying to wade through at the moment so good thank you you know we're going to talk more about this in a little bit but i really want that phrase to resonate with our audience core beliefs that are antithetical to a biblical worldview. I know we're probably not going to get to unpack everything on the show today, but when we look at themes like fatherlessness, we see this sobering trend. I know when I was in grad school, I first read about this concept when I was in Regent University and I studied David Blankenhorn's sociologist work, and he called fatherlessness America's most urgent social crisis, like our most pressing problem. And I love that in your work, you're not ignoring these stats. You're not burying your head in the sand and pretending like everything's okay. You're talking about these painful truths of fatherlessness and abortion in the black community. And when we're looking at entities, like you said, that have core beliefs antithetical to a biblical worldview, and maybe some of our listeners are are feeling that same pressure to conform and, and they're confused, that singular dividing line that you talked about is the truth of God's word. Let's pause for a commercial break right now. And when we come back, we'll unpack the formative foundations of our mindsets and discover how renewing those mindsets can activate your faith, reset your organizational culture and transform your interpersonal relationships. I'm Dr. Lisa Dunn, and thanks for joining us here on Mindset Matters. We'll be right back after this break. There's more Mindset Matters with Dr. Lisa Dunn still to come right here on K-Praise. Ready to change the world? Chula Vista Christian University is here to help you reach your career goals in a debt-free, faith-based, learner-driven model. Chula Vista Christian University offers undergraduate degree programs in science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, music, and ministry. Pursue your college education in a mentor-based format that's built on individualized instruction instead of a one-size-fits-all approach. Chula Vista Christian University partners with families and the local church to create a whole student model of transformative education that equips the mind and nurtures the soul. Why invest in institutions that undermine your Christian values? Join the reform movement of spiritual restoration through higher education. Discover your dreams, pursue your passion, and change the world. Text the word APPLY to 52855 to start your journey. That's text the word APPLY to 52855. Or learn more at cvcu.us. 
Chula Vista Christian University, college, different. Feeling unprotected and falling behind? Struggling to keep up with your finances, your kids, your insurance? Then let State Farm agent Frank Torrey help you simplify and get to a better state. Because with Frank handling your insurance needs, you'll have more time for everything else. More money, too, since bundling State Farm policies can earn discounts up to 28% on each product. Protect the important things in life. Call State Farm agent Frank Torrey, 858-485-8300. That's 858-485-8300. Legacy, integrity, and excellence. Buying a home is buying a lifestyle. It's the neighborhood generations will grow up in. Buying a home takes an expert that knows the San Diego market and will get you the best deal. Our goal is to help you unlock generational wealth through real estate so you can leave a legacy. I'm Monique Gonzalez, owner of Monique Gonzalez Real Estate. Call me today at 619-995-6622 or MoniqueGonzalez.com. What started decades ago with a $2,000 loan from a sibling is now one of the strongest and most trusted customs brokerages in the region, representing farmers and produce distributors in the U.S. and Mexico. The family-run business of Rancho Customs Brokers thrives in problem-solving, legal protection, and FDA consulting for import matters. Anybody can do data entry, but Rancho Customs Brokers will not rest until the job is done and your problems are solved. Visit RanchoCustomsBrokers.com to learn more. It's time to find out more on how to renew your mindset on Mindset Matters. Now here's your host, Dr. Lisa Dunn on K-Praise. Welcome back. I'm your host, Dr. Lisa Dunn, and thanks for joining us here on Mindset Matters. We are unpacking some practical tools that will activate your faith, reset your organizational culture, and transform your interpersonal relationships. Today on the show, we have culture shaper Kevin McGarry with us, and we are unpacking next the concept of critical race theory. Kevin, talk to us about what's happening across America in our churches and universities today with regard to critical race theory. Yeah, let's let's talk about that. So uh, critical race theory is really built on the foundation of Marxism. Now, some even people in faith don't really understand what's the problem with Marxism. You know, I've had a a conversation with a number of pastors across the country who said, look, um, I don't really have a problem with Marxism. And then I give them sort of what Marxism really is and where it comes from. And then they tend to have a different perspective. If you don't mind, I can just give everyone, all of your listeners, a really quick, yeah, here's here's a really quick synopsis of where Marxism comes from. It started in the 1400s with, with Plato, then Thomas Hobbes, Thomas More, you know, and basically these are people who have major works that were written during their times. And each of these other uh, sort of people that participated in this, Thomas Hobbes and then Thomas More, and then, um, and then you have uh, Hegel. Uh, everybody is sort of taking a body of work from the other and then evolving it. So this is sort of an evolving track. And then we come to Marx and Ingo's uh, in the late 1800s. And then of course the published works in the 19, early 1900s. So, um, so this is an evolution of about 500 years of works from a number of different people who participated in this. Here is one simple uh, way that you can think about Marxism. All five of these individuals, and there were probably a number of other minor authors during that time as well. All five of these individuals had one common denominator, one thing that they all five subscribed to. Their one fundamental tenet that they all agreed with was they were virulent atheists. All of them. Plato, Thomas Hobbes, Thomas More, uh, Hegel, Marx and Engels, they hated the notion of God, hated. And so, you know, so we have a demonic work. This is, this work was, was, was manifested in the laboratories of demonism and culminated in, in a single body of work. Um, You know, Marxism, actually it's, it's a three tiered piece of work. Marxism, uh, it starts with socialism, then Marxism, then communism. And basically they're a variation of the same thing, but the ultimate goal of socialism is to evolve to a point of, of communism, Marxism being in the middle. And there's diff- different, you know, I don't want to break that down now that there's a whole another understanding as to which stage incorporates what and, and how that manifests in society. But 
Okay, so that's that's where that comes from. And that's why it's so dangerous for people of faith to subscribe to Marxism, socialism, communism, because it is demonic. There is nothing good uh, that came that comes with it. It has evolved from uh, the pits, the pits of hell. So there you go. So now now with that, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we discussed yesterday, which was. Uh, the thinking is back in the day, and to your point, you know, Dr. Lisa, you did mention the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Yeah, that was when when you know Engels and Marx did their works. They they had to you know all of their works revolved around trying to divide society. So they had to come up with this, this scheme and ways of seeing one another and having us sort of at conflict and 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 and, and jealous and covetous of one another, et cetera, et cetera. So they came up with this whole idea of bourgeoisie, which were the sort of upper crust and the proletariat, which would be the working class. And uh, in today's nomenclature, today's vernacular, it is they had to simplify it because we we have a attention span of about a nanosecond these days. So the simpler way to see it today would be oppressor and the oppressed or the oppressor and the victim class. And so that what that means is um, Critical race theory basically asserts that anybody with uh, that lacks melanin, so anybody white, I us put it plainly, um, is an oppressor. And they're an oppressor because they're, uh, there's hegemony, they're the more dominant uh, race here in America. Uh, and uh, with it comes all kinds of additional privileges. So they are uh, privileged, they are supremacists, and they can't help it. They're completely irredeemable because they're white and uh, they were born to be the oppressor. This is how critical race theorists see the race in that classification in America today. So, um, so now we have, you know, these people that are basically overlaying an accusation and guilt on an entire race of people even after we've come out of the civil rights movement where Dr. Martin Luther King said, look, let's not judge anybody based on the color of their skin, but strictly based on the content of character. Uh, so that used to be, you know, our marching orders and uh, everybody that, that, that resonated strongly with everybody. Now we're back to no, let's fully segregate based on skin color. Let's let's overlay accusation and guilt on an entire group of people, whether we know them or not, they are guilty of being racist, period, end of story, full stop. And the way that that's antithetical with the Bible is, as we know, Jesus came to redeem all. There, there, there is no distinction of skin color. Now, the other thing that we have to remember, and even our anti-racist, uh, most of the authors in that of today do admit, that the distinction of race itself is a social construct. So this is not a, a anthropolo anthropological or, or biological or physiological distinction. It is a so purely a social construct. And, uh, you know, ethnicity and culture uh, could, you could say, are real distinctions, but, but race itself is not. Uh, nevertheless, race is used as, as sort of the trump card to uh, hoist accusation, guilt, shame, um, and to try to really literally cancel. That's the whole goal. They want to cancel whiteness. And so we know that that's antithetical because the Bible tells us Jesus came to redeem all peoples. Uh, Ephesians tells us, Ephesians 2.15, that we were all reconciled. The all barriers and walls of hostility and injustice and all of that was dealt with with the cross. So how do you reconcile what's happening with some of these major theologies that are impacting our the fundamental foundations of our theology, that being the Bible, um, and actually preach these things in many cases over the pulpit when it's completely antithetical. We can't even make sense of it. Right. Like you said, it's an urgent time for the American church. And I think, you know, looking around, we can obviously agree that biblical illiteracy is reigning across the board. And this is why so much of this is happening. It's people don't have a, a foundation, don't have an anchor to the truth of God's word. 
Ken Ham always said famously, one race, one blood. And I think I think one of the things you said yesterday that was so powerful that you've just illuminated here again is the, that concept of division. The end goal is division. You're different. I'm different. You're irredeemable. You use that word many times. And it was so powerful because Romans 12, 2, you know, that we're transformed by the renewing of our minds, metamorpho, that is that literal transformation that was spoken to adults, you know, that we're, we're tr transformable throughout our entire lifespan. And so to put a label and say that someone's not transformable. But I think that issue of division, we've seen it play out so powerfully, so tragically across our nation. And it's like churches are just not waking up to the fact that division is the work of the enemy, right? Yeah. The accuser of the brethren, yeah, that's the one we're on the side. And you said yesterday, you know, the enemy has the church doing his job right now. Exactly right. right. Yeah, the perfect example of that is... Uh, well, there's a couple of things I want to say about that. So the reason why I think it's it's really ca catching root within the body of Christ is we have all of our major seminaries, and now all of them, even our most conservative ones, SBC, SBC was is, was considered one of the most conservative. Now they're even teaching it, are, are teaching critical race theory. Now they say that they're teaching it from the perspective of just, you know, personal knowledge and we just need to be aware of it. But the reality is we have a lot of uh, theologians and professors uh, that operate in that realm that are literally teaching it, not from, hey, this is just an FYI, you need to get a heads up on this is what's coming, but they're actually encouraging, uh, from what I can tell, a lot of these uh, pastors and people that are getting their MDiv degrees to come out and actually start to begin to infuse this demonic gospel with the purity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this is, this is a very, very, very dangerous time. So that's, that's number one. Number two is, um, uh, so we, it, it is gaining a lot of traction within our church uh, environments. And I do think that um, there is, that we do need to get back as individuals to begin to read the word of God. Now, what happens over the past year or so with COVID is we've been disconnected, uh, most of us or a lot of us from our churches. And, um, you know, the thought would be, well, that just gives us more time to search the word on our own and get into that word on our own. But I think that we've we've actually, now by this time, we've, we've put enough of the other activities in the middle of what we would have normally taken part in on a Sunday morning or Wednesday night or Saturday and whatever it is. And so now we have a church that's really fundamentally disconnected from the gospel. I mean, I'm amazed when I go into my audiences and I bring up these various scriptures, how uh, so many people come up and say, I didn't even, wow, I didn't even know that was there. I, I, that's, man, I, that's some good word right there. I mean, so we're just, we, we have to get reacquainted with the word of God. It is our anchor. It is our source for all of these problems. At the end of the day, we must come to some sort of conclusion whether indeed the gospel and the word of God and the cross is enough for us. So the problem statement in our thesis here then is, as you put it, the church is fundamentally disconnected from the truth of God's word. And we need to remedy that in this generation. The heart of this cancel culture, this divisiveness, this doctrine of demons is a missile against the church. And its goal is total destruction. It's time for churches to wake up. And as you said, Kevin, we need to know that Jesus is enough. We're going to continue unpacking this topic next week. So we're going to come back for a part two of this session. Make sure you join us right here on Mindset Matters next Saturday at 11 p.m. right here on K Praise Radio. Thanks for joining us here today on Mindset Matters with Dr. Lisa Dunn. Each week, you'll gain practical tools to activate your faith, reset your organizational culture, and transform your interpersonal relationships. If you have questions about today's show, or if you'd like to be a guest on a future show, you can email Dr. Dunn at contact at drlisadunn.com. That's contact at drlisadunn, spelled D-U-N-N-E, dot com. Or text the word mindset to 52855. That's mindset to 52855. To learn more about our sponsor, Chula Vista Christian University, visit cvcu.us. That's cvcu.us. 
And be sure to join us right here next Saturday at 11 p.m. for the next episode of Mindset Matters. Did you know that almost 70% of Christian students walk away from the faith their freshman year of college? Some enroll in public programs with the hopes of being a light in a dark place, but the vast majority succumb to the surrounding secular influences. Others enroll in costly private programs, only to end up drowning in debt. What does it profit a man, Mark 836 asks, if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? CVCU's debt-free faith-based model is committed to nurturing the values of Christian community, upholding the standards of moral excellence, and stewarding your most precious investment, your children. Chula Vista Christian University, defending the faith and educating the next generation one student at a time. Learn more at cvcu.us or text APPLY to 52855. That's text the word APPLY to 52855 or visit cvcu.us to get your journey started today. That's